Setting up a unified network is pretty straightforward, but securing it and running it properly is where things get tougher. In this video, I'll walk you through five best practices to help you harden your Unify setup and improve reliability. Whether you're building a new network or securing an existing one, these are some of the best practices that you should follow. So the first one is that when in doubt, isolate your VLANs. So what I mean by that is when you come in here and create a new VLAN, and if you're using Unify network, most likely you will have multiple VLANs. One of the toughest things for people to kind of understand and implement properly is firewall rules. So when you come inside of here, I'm just gonna create a test VLAN. In the manual section here, you have a few different options. If you wanna disable external internet access, you could just uncheck this box here. But this isolate network feature here is very, very powerful. So I'm gonna check that off and I'm going to add this VLAN. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to the policy engine, which this is new in Unified Network 9.2. But what you'll see here is that it got added to our internal zone. Now we're gonna talk about zones in a second here, but more importantly, what I wanna show you is exactly what happens when you create a network and you isolate it. So inside of that internal zone, we are going to click internal, internal. And what you'll see here is that by default, it has access to everything. However, if you scroll down here and you can ignore these uh, firewall rules that I have here, in a blank setup, what you'd have is allow all traffic and isolated networks. This isolated networks firewall rule is what is created when you isolate a network. If you select that, what you'll see is that you are blocking access from this specific IP subnet, which is the subnet of our test VLAN that we just created, and we're blocking it anywhere. So that means that by default, even though it is part of this internal zone that we created, and we have other VLANs inside of that, this specific VLAN cannot access anything else. Now, if you go down and you start to look at the other zones, you'll see that there is an isolated networks as well. So what we're in essence saying is, if the network is isolated, by default, it cannot access anything else. So if you're creating, let's say, an IoT VLAN, and you just want an easy way to ensure that that IoT VLAN can't access anything else, and you want to also not really have to worry about firewall rules, that one checkbox will do everything that you need. So again, I will reiterate it. When in doubt, isolate the network. If you know for a fact that a network should not access anything else, just isolate it. That is the absolute easiest way to do it. And depending on where that VLAN goes, meaning the exact zone it's part of, it will still be isolated so you won't ever have to worry about it. So while we're here, the next best practice is going to be around creating zones that actually make sense. So the zone-based firewall, in my opinion, is a great addition. It makes it a lot easier to manage the firewall and understand exactly what can and cannot access other VLANs. Now, by default, you're going to have from internal all the way down to DMZ. These are your default zones. Now, I created two other zones. I created untrusted internet and untrusted no internet. It's as basic as it sounds. Untrusted internet is for devices that I don't trust, but that I do allow to access the internet. And untrusted no internet is devices that I don't trust that I don't want to access the internet. Now this is what you could see I have in these zones. So IoT is untrusted internet, and then my surveillance and my Proxmox cluster, which most people won't have, but those VLANs are part of this untrusted no internet zone, in essence saying that they can communicate with one another, but they cannot communicate with the external internet. Now, why zones are very powerful is because if you come in here and create a test zone, what you'll see is that by default, the test zone cannot access anything other than the gateway and the internet. That's it. That's as basic as it comes. So you'll see block all, and then all the way down here, it's block all for everything. So that means that by default, any VLANs that you put inside of these zones will not be able to access one another and will not be able to access anything else. So then how do you improve that? Well, you improve it in essence by saying that you have to go in and manually create firewall rules to allow the devices inside of these zones to access other VLANs. 
So using the internal zone and the test zone, what you'll see is that our internal zone, which is our most trusted zone, cannot even access devices in this test zone. And that's by design. So in essence, what you would want to do is you would want to come in here and create a policy that says that anything in the internal zone is allowed to access anything in the test zone. And then the auto allow return traffic will allow the test devices to respond to those requests. So without this, you would have to create a second firewall rule. But what you'll see, I'll show you in a second here, is when you auto allow return traffic and you add this policy, what you'll see is that this zone right here just went from block all to allow return. And this is for the internal zone. So what we're saying is that the test zone can reply to traffic when an internal device initiates the connection. So the easiest way to think of it is that an internal device is trying to communicate with this test zone. It will work. The test zone is trying to communicate with the internal zone. It will not work. It's the easiest way to think about it. Have a few other videos that explain really in granular detail how this works, but that is the absolute easiest way to think about it. So why is this important? This goes back to our main point. You wanna create zones that make sense. For me, what makes sense is untrusted zones that either can communicate with the internet or cannot communicate with the internet. So if I created a new VLAN and I didn't want that VLAN to be able to communicate with anything else, but I did want it to access the internet, I would just put it in this untrusted internet zone. And then at that point, because it's part of a zone, it will assume the same firewall rules that that zone has. So in essence, what we're saying is we don't have to go in and recreate all different firewall rules. The zone is configured with the firewall rules that we want. And then at that point, because that VLAN is part of that zone, it will have the same firewall rules as well. Which then leads us into our next best practice, which is again around the firewall, but it's limiting access to ports only. So I have a full firewall video that I will link to if you're really interested in understanding how Unify Firewall rules work. That will give you a good baseline. But what ends up happening to a lot of people is that they say initially that they don't want any of their VLANs to communicate with one another. So we'll use an example. We'll say the trusted VLAN and an IoT VLAN. And we say, you know what? I don't want the IoT VLAN to ever communicate with the trusted VLAN. And that determines the initial firewall. So basically you would just go in, isolate the network and you would be done just like we did in the first step of this video. But what ends up happening is that you have devices that have to communicate with one another. So what ends up happening at that point is that people will go in and they will create firewall rules that will allow access from one device to either an entire zone or from one device to an entire device. So I'll give you an example here. But using this untrusted no internet zone, what you'll see here is that I have a few firewall rules. And these are firewall rules really for just virtual machines that I have on that VLAN, but that have to communicate with other devices on my internal uh, VLAN, mainly NAS devices and Docker and stuff like that. So I'll use this allow VM surveillance to UNAS Pro. So what you'll see here is that on this firewall rule, what I did, is I came in and I said that the VM surveillance device can communicate with my UNAS Pro that I'm just using an object for on the SMB port. This is the piece that everybody for the most part misses. You want to follow a least permissive approach. So when I say that, I know for a fact that my surveillance VLAN should not communicate with my UNAS Pro on absolutely anything other than SMB. So what ends up happening is a lot of the times, people will come in and they'll create this rule, but in this port section here, they're gonna select any. And what that is saying is that the VM surveillance device can communicate with the UNAS Pro on any port, unrestricted access. Your entire goal is to create a least permissive environment. So that's why I select the specific ports that that device should communicate with. Now, in certain cases, it's going to be multiple ports. It might have to access multiple different services on that device. 
And in that case, you'd either create multiple firewall rules with those ports, or you could come in here and use the object and just create exactly which ports that device should access and have it all in one list. There's not a right or wrong way of doing it. It's how you want to do it. But what you'll see here is that if I close out of this, these destination ports, these are the exact ports that these devices have to communicate with. If they try to access anything else, they will be blocked. That is a least permissive approach. I'm saying that you can communicate with exactly what you need to communicate and nothing more. Now, do you have to do this? No, you don't have to do this. But we're talking about best practices here and you have to look at your risk tolerance level, what you're open to, and determine exactly where you stand. Meaning, is it going to be unrestricted access or is it gonna be highly specific access like this? That's up to you. But from a best practice perspective, you really wanna allow communication and only communication that is actually needed. So the next one is going to be Ethernet port profiles. And I've talked about this a few times, but you really need to structure your switches this way. It will save you in the long run. So I came in here and I created an individual Ethernet port profile for all of the VLANs that I use with wired devices. So I'll use this trusted Ethernet port profile as an example. But what you're going to see here is that I say that the native VLAN for that is the trusted VLAN. But that port on those devices is allowed to tag these other VLANs. Now we're not saying that the trusted VLAN cannot access anything else. That's not what we're saying with this. What we are saying is that it can tag that traffic. So if for whatever reason, the trusted VLAN had to access a VLAN that's outside of this list, well then it has to go all the way to the firewall it has to see if the firewall rules allow that traffic and then it accesses it that way. So this generally does not have anything to do with the firewall rules and what this VLAN can and cannot access. That's handled at the firewall. But from a tagged traffic perspective, this determines exactly what this VLAN can tag. And I'll show you an example. This is my Proxmox server and this device, this hypervisor is on the trusted VLAN. But what I just showed you is that that trusted VLAN can tag other traffic. So inside of this VLAN tag option here, if I came in here and I created a tag for, we'll say my surveillance VLAN, when I run through and create this virtual machine, this device itself will spin up as if it was on the surveillance VLAN. But what we're really doing is we're allowing Proxmox to tag that traffic for this virtual machine. Now, there are examples of this just about everywhere, but this is, in my head, the absolute easiest way to understand it. We're allowing this port to tag traffic on these other VLANs. So what you'll see here is 220, and if we come back here, you'll see that we allow 220. So let's say we didn't allow it. At that point, what I just showed you would not work because it's not allowed to tag that traffic. So that's what this does. Now, why would you manage it this way? Very, very simple. On a switch itself, you can select Ethernet port profile, and then you can come in here and select the exact Ethernet port profile that you wanted, but it allows you to centrally manage everything. So if you ever had to go in and add a VLAN, you wanted to start tagging traffic, you wanted to stop tagging traffic, that is how you can hit all of your ports at the same time. If you don't do it with an ethernet port profile, you would have to individually hit every single one of your ports. Number one, it leads to potential errors where you think they're the same, but they're not the same. Number two, it's harder to manage everything. And number three, there's no real way to have oversight over everything. I mean, you could check every single individual switch if you wanted to, but if your goal is always to manage your devices using an Ethernet port profile, you don't have to worry as much. So Ethernet port profiles are what I believe everybody should set up from a best practice perspective. Now, the next one is going to be a sneak peek for Unified Network 9.3. So this came out a few days ago. And this is around some of the Unify Network 9.3 changes. But if you scroll down here, there's a very important thing that you're going to see here, and it is added support for CNAME DNS records. 
If you don't know what this is, we're going to talk about it in a second. But this is something that people have wanted for a very, very long time and is drastically going to change your DNS record management, assuming you use your Unify Gateway as your DNS server. So what you'll see here is a lot of my DNS records. And what you're going to notice is that almost all of them point to 10.2.1.215. Why is that? 10.2.1.215 is my internal reverse proxy server. If you don't know what that is, in essence, it just allows me to have a domain name with a valid SSL certificate for all of my services. So every single one of these services on my dashboard here, if I access them, you will see they have a valid wildcard SSL certificate. I have a video on this if you're interested. But that is all done using my internal reverse proxy server with Nginx Proxy Manager. Now this is not how you want to do this, meaning how I did this, creating A records for everything, that is not what you want to do. What you really want to do is you want to create an individual DNS record for one of these services. So I'm going to scroll down and it's VM Docker. That's the host that's running it. And what you could see is that this is a fixed IP address on that virtual machine itself, 10.2.1.215. But every single one of my services has an A record for that IP address. So if that server ever changed, if I ever moved it and it had a different IP address, what I'm saying is I got to come back and individually update every single one of these DNS records that is an A record with 10.2.1.215 in it. Now, the way that you fix that is that you create a CNAME record. And a CNAME record points to a domain name. So the way that every single one of these would work moving forward is rather than pointing an A record to an IP address, I would point a CNAME record to this one DNS record down here. So uptime and your backup and sync thing, et cetera, all of these services that are pointing to 10.2.1.215 would actually be CNAME records that would point to this one record here, VM Docker. And if that ever changes, the only thing I have to do is update VM Docker to have the correct IP address. And then every single one of those DNS records would point directly to it. Everything gets updated with one change. Right now, I have like 20 or 30 changes I'll have to make. Now, this is something, unfortunately, you can't do right now. But in the near future, I don't know exactly when Unified Network 9.3 is getting released. In the near future, if you are using A records like I am, this is something that you should change right away because even though you'll have to go back and update everything, you will benefit from it at some point in the future. And it's better to manage your DNS records this way than the way I am currently doing. And funny enough, this started out with a few DNS records and you can see how quickly it grew out of control. So even if you only have a few and you don't think it's a big deal, in time, it could potentially grow into something much, much larger. So those are five of the best practices that I personally use or will use in the case of CNAME support in my Unify setup. They have made a huge difference in the performance and stability of my network, as well as the security, as a lot of these are security-based. I'm hoping that these tips helped you out, but if you have anything that you think I missed, be sure to put those in the comments so others can see them. But other than that, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.